My wife of 22 years was busily packing a few of her most cherished items in plastic storage boxes, humming to herself like she was doing a casual spring cleaning. I in turn was standing in the doorway of our family room, watching Amanda with tears flowing down my face. Despair and a sense of total powerlessness rippled through my soul knowing she was minutes away from the sudden abandonment of our life together. Part of me already hated her for the betrayal she had so unemotionally informed me just hours ago. But truthfully, part of me also hated myself for breaking down like I did, and even now with me silently crying. I guess a real man like her lover, Mike Jericho, would have acted out in some other fashion. But he wasn't the one being betrayed. He was the man my wife was going to live with in California. Standing there, with Amanda seemingly obvious of my presence, I ran the events of the past few months through my head, trying to make sense of everything. It had started about six months prior with Amanda's employer, a national insurance company, hiring Jericho as an efficiency consultant. He supposedly was the best in restructuring companies by cutting waste and the usual other business-related bullshit. The contract Jericho had with Amanda's employer had him there for six to nine months. Amanda, as a department head, was tasked to work closely with him to make the reorganization as smooth and quickly as possible. That's where things now obviously went as shit. Before this asshole Jericho showed up, my wife had never given me the slightest hint that she would ever be unfaithful. She was the type of wife that got semi-hurt if I casually looked at another woman while we were out in public. She would then make her usual comment about how I was the love of her life and couldn't begin to imagine being with another man. Jericho must truly be one amazing man because it only took two months to get my wife to willingly spread her legs for him. This day had started as usual with me making reservations at Amanda's favorite restaurant, which I was going to surprise her with that evening. Instead, I got a call from her after lunch asking me to return home now. Of course, I rushed home to find her unnaturally calm sitting on the couch. My first thought was that something had happened to our kids. Sally, our oldest, was a nurse in New York City and Kevin was in the army station at Fort Lewis, Washington. Please sit down, Bruce, she said. I have some difficult news to tell you. Are the kids okay? I asked immediately as I sat next to her. Yes, they're fine. It's about you and me and something that I never expected to happen. Like some surprise attack Amanda admitted, she was in love with another man and was leaving me that day. She also told me flat out it was Mike Jericho someone she had mentioned only a few times in passing since he had arrived. I met the guy once when I had to pick Amanda up from work because her car was in the shop. Standing in the lobby watching Jericho interact with others, it took less than a minute to realize he was the type who believed his shit didn't stink, that the flashy clothes he was wearing, complete with the rings on his fingers and a gold Rolex on his wrist, along with his greasy charm and good looks, could get him anything he wanted. Never in a million years would I believe my wife would fall for that crap. Amanda tried to explain it this way, that when she began working with Jericho, she felt an instant connection that only got deeper as the days and weeks passed. That she was sorry for how this happened, and that I had been a wonderful husband, but she knew it was time to start a new phase of her life. I can't believe you're seriously doing this, Amanda, I said watching her secure the lids on the storage boxes. This is crazy. You really don't know Jericho, and while I accept that things between us may have gotten stale, but I can't believe you're going to throw away our life together like this. I said in a whimpering voice that offended me on many levels. Mike has completely explained his past to me. My wife replied back with a strange look I had never seen before. It took a second to realize the difference. For our entire marriage, when Amanda looked at me, there was a special soft smile and glint in her eyes that told me I was loved. That look of love had helped me through a bunch of difficult times from the death of my father to my sister's cancer fight. Amanda now looked at me with a combination of cold indifference mixed with annoyance. In an afternoon of blows to my soul, I think this was the worst. I knew then that there was no hope. She was in some form of love with another man. Bruce, she said, please try to understand and be happy for me. Are you fucking serious, Amanda? I yelled back my body shaking from the insane words coming out of her mouth. It was at that moment Amanda rushed over and grabbed both of my hands and pulled me close. I wasn't foolish enough to believe she had suddenly come to her senses, but then again I didn't pull away. Bruce, I've made my choice. You're going to have to let me go, she said, 
then releasing my hands and turning back to the two boxes she had packed. Amanda attempted to lift them herself off a table, a task that was difficult, but she got them to the floor and on the hand truck we kept for such tasks. Realizing that she was done with me as both a husband and person, I allowed her to maneuver the boxes out the front door on her own and over to her SUV. After popping the rear hatch, I saw two large travel cases in the back, which had to contain the clothes she was taking to start her new life. When Amanda explained the situation about her leaving with Jericho, she told me that in the coming divorce, I would get the house and both cars. Amanda also added that she had told her lawyer not to pursue alimony. My stomach clenched because the way Amanda made those statements, it was like she was trying to pass those things off like a grand consolation prize. At that moment, my thoughts flashed to the old game shows that offered up a year's supply of rice to loser contestants before they were booted off the stage. All Amanda wanted in the divorce was half of our joint savings, a sum that came to $65,000. She was leaving behind the 3,000-square-foot home we had lived in for 15 years, a house that she had obsessed over from everything to the foundation all the way up to the roof. Every item in the house, from the fixtures to the paint on the walls, to the make of the furniture and appliances were chosen by her. She loved that house in a way I often couldn't understand. Given all the time and effort she put into its creation and development, I couldn't help but wonder if Amanda had suffered a brain injury that had altered her personality. Bruce, along with the divorce papers, I've left contact information on the desk in your office in case something happens to the kids. She said getting into her car. Tell the kids I'll be in touch in a few weeks. Screw you, Amanda. I said with anger building. I will not be relegated to some messenger between you and our kids. You're going to have to explain your actions to them personally. And I know our kids, they will not accept Jericho in their lives, and they might cut you out completely. That statement seemed to pierce the thick affair fog for a moment, crashing the beautiful delusion that had consumed her. Of course, she quickly shook it off and got in her car and cranked it up. Just when I thought Amanda would just drive away, she rolled down her window. Bruce, she said, I'll have a driver return my car. You can keep it, give it to one of the kids, or sell it. I won't need it where I'm going. With that, she rolled up the window, pulled out of the driveway, and drove away. It was then that the neighbors learned what had just transpired because I collapsed on the ground sobbing uncontrollably. Luckily for me, one of my oldest friends was a lawyer who could handle divorces. Robert Carter and I went back to our days playing high school football. He was the person I called a couple of hours after Amanda had driven off to begin her fairy tale come true. This took place after a few neighbors found me lying on the driveway and carried me back into the house. In the following days, Robert found Amanda's lawyer easy to work with since she had clearly laid out to him that this was to be an uncontested divorce. Amanda had already transferred the $65,000 in our joint savings to another account, and with her attorney, signed away any claim to alimony and the house, and her car which was returned the following day. All I had to do was wait from 30 to 90 days for the divorce to make its way through the bureaucracy. Robert assured me though that my wait would more than likely be around the one-month mark. I don't remember much of the following weeks. Luckily, my boss and co-workers at the engineering firm I worked at knew what happened with my marriage and took care of the few unfinished assignments I had at the time. Once they were squared away, my boss even used a little-known company hardship policy to get me an extended leave of absence. My kids, Sally and Kevin, had thrown their full support behind me once they learned of what their mother had done. They both desperately wanted to return home, but the demands of their own adult lives made that impossible. As far as Amanda contacting them, you would think a mother who was suddenly leaving their father after more than two decades of marriage would have called her kids to try and explain. But no, when I reached the kids after talking with Robert, I found out they hadn't received any communication from their mother in several weeks. Goddamn, that Mike Jericho must have one magic dick. After talking with Robert and the kids, I pretty much shut down after that, refusing to leave the house or talk to anyone else. A few weeks later, some sense of self-awareness finally crept back the morning after Robert called to tell me it was time to sign the papers. Of course, that would have required me to be presentable in public. So I stumbled into the master bathroom, where Amanda had taken a full month to decide on the decor and proper fixtures, and looked at myself in the mirror. For the first time ever I saw a thin, hollowed-eyed stranger with a thick, unkempt beard full of gray. Thinking back at that moment, 
I couldn't remember the last time I had a real meal. I lost at least 30 pounds since Amanda left and honestly looked so close to death it scared me. I became so mad then at how I had been used and betrayed I did something totally out of character for me. I punched the mirror with my fist. The glass shattered all over the sink. My right hand was badly cut with blood going everywhere. It took a visit to the emergency room and a few stitches to finally clear my head. I still had enough time afterwards to get cleaned up and go to Robert's office. Robert looked on with some concern as I signed the divorce papers in his firm's conference room. Who would have thought that a hardened divorce attorney who had gone through his own marital nightmare could still have empathy for a stupid client who still loved his errant wife? Well, Bruce, you are officially divorced, Robert said in a way that was supposed to bring me some relief. Yay me, I said with spite. Bruce, he said standing up bringing an end to our meeting. I know this sucks, but I've got to say you came away from this divorce mostly unscathed. Losing just $65,000 in the settlement, given your shared wealth, is a win in anyone's book. With this state's divorce laws, I've known cheating wives that have taken almost everything from their former husbands. I stayed silent, taking no comfort in Robert's words as I stood up to shake his hand and leave. It was then that I caught sight of the pretty paralegal entering the room, a blonde somewhere in her twenties looking at me visibly overwhelmed with pity. A more dynamic and smarter version of me probably could have milked her emotions for a rebound pity fuck. But in truth, that talent for me never existed. I was clearly no Mike Jericho. Having Jericho take my wife and live rent-free in my head was almost too much to bear. I walked out to my car wondering just what in the hell I would do now. My wife and kids held all the meaning in my life. The kids were grown and out on their own. So Amanda had become my purpose. I fucking cried after getting in the car totally oblivious if anyone saw me break down. A tea some point? I guess a self-preservation instinct kicked in and I regained my composure. It was the last time I cried over Amanda. A couple of weeks later I'm back at work trying to rebuild my life. I think the worst thing was the looks that the others gave me. There were several variations. I was mostly looked at with deep pity. But there were a few looks of suspicion with some whispering there had to be a reason why Amanda threw away what on the surface looked like a perfect marriage. The real hell for me was when I returned to the house we shared. Amanda's ghost was everywhere given all the time and effort she had done to create what for her was the perfect home. It was so overwhelming I had dreams each night of her returning to me begging for forgiveness. It was obvious what my next move would be. Just a few days later a moving van rented by a used furniture dealer backed into the driveway. I sold him, at a bargain price just despite Amanda's metaphorical ghost, almost every item in the house that wasn't bolted down. When he and his workers left there was only a bed for me, the large screen television, the basic kitchen appliances, a couch, and my recliner. The house was so empty, any sound echoed through it like a cave. I wasn't done yet. Even when the kids were living with us Amanda's creation was insanely too large for a family of four. I had no intention of living in it alone any longer than I had to. I called a real estate agent the next day. A few weeks later I found a nice patio home for sale and snapped it up immediately. The big house was also listed at a bargain price and bought by a family with four young kids. Seeing the wonder in the eyes of the mom and dad as they walked through the empty rooms of their new home brought me my first joy in months. A little over four months had passed since Amanda destroyed my world and I was developing a new normal for my life. Especially heartening was that both Sally and Kevin had in no uncertain terms cut their mother out of their lives. Apparently Amanda and Jericho went on a two-week-long cruise after arriving in California and she didn't try to contact the kids until well after it was over. It was a little after the six-month point of Amanda leaving that I got a phone call from an unknown number. It was late in the day, and I had just cooked a frozen pizza and popped the top on a beer when the phone bust. I declined the call and went back to the movie I was watching. At some point it occurred to me to look up the area code, and I laughed when I learned it was the one from the San Francisco area. I figured it was probably from a telemarketer, but I found it comforting how much I didn't care one way or the other if it was Amanda trying to make contact. It was the eight-month mark when everything blew up. I got a call from Amanda's sister, correctly named Karen because she was one, informing me that Amanda had tried to contact me. I instantly thought back to the unknown call from the San Francisco area. Well, Karen, I said, 
I'll take your word for it, but I haven't received any call from her. And frankly, our marriage ended on really bad terms, so I don't have any desire to talk with her. Plus, according to your sister's own words, Mike Jericho is her true soulmate. If it involves the kids, whatever relationship she can rebuild with them is on her. Not only will I not help my ex-wife with anything, I really don't know if I would piss on Amanda if I saw her on fire. Karen and I only tolerated each other at the best of times, so not surprisingly she hung up without saying another word. Though, I couldn't help but ponder what might have gone wrong between Amanda and Jericho. If Amanda had run head first into some form of reality with her lover, she was going to be in a world of trouble for someone to save her. My former father-in-law and mother-in-law were dead and Amanda's sister and her husband were taking care of his aging parents. And even if Sally and Kevin were speaking to their mother, neither had any way for her to live with them. 